the Sabbath. Denise, can you hear me in the kitchen? I just wanted to... Hey, Denise, step to the doorway for a second. Do you know why the disciples went out? Because of persecution. They were all locked up in Jerusalem, and it was the persecution that drove them out. They weren't listening to that. That's why the persecution came. I thank Yahweh for his word. And I'm on a clock watch. Try to be compact. Uh, my heart is with those that churches uh, a part of their routine. You know, it's just the normal routine. You get up and go to church on Saturday or Sunday, and you know, Grandma did it, Mom did it, Dad did. Um, you know, it's just routine. My heart is heavy for those that spend their so much time serving Yahweh and when life gets difficult wonders about what's the point um, and I guess the bottom line is I want to know when did Yahweh the God of the universe become your genie in a bottle because that's what I see in the world. I see in the world, you know, uh, you know, if he doesn't bless me fast enough the way I want it, what's the point? I see people, uh, you know, questioning the goodness of Yahweh because of their circumstances. Uh, I see people, you know, like doing all this, doubting and questioning because they don't have, wondering about why don't they have, and looking, uh, not uncommonly, David talks about it in more than one psalm, looking at the wicked and wondering, well, why are they doing so well? And, you know, I'm serving you, praising you, I'm doing this and doing that, where's mine? You know, and Yahweh told David, don't do that. He said, because they'll get theirs. You know, it's about you being faithful to me. So I was looking at uh, a few months ago when we went through the book of Genesis. I looked at the covenant, not the one given to Noah, which is an interesting covenant. I was looking on that. Yahweh said he would not destroy the world anymore by flood. But he sure didn't say he wouldn't destroy the world. <laughs> Just he won't do it again with the water. Interesting covenant. But I want to look at the covenant that I see that is the all-encompassing covenant, which, of course, was the one that Yahweh made with Abraham. And the sign of that covenant was circumcision. That was the sign of the covenant. That was not the covenant, just in case you didn't know that. The covenant is found in Genesis 17, 7. And I am reading from NIV. I will be using some other translations as well. Abraham, let's see, am I in the right place? 17, 7. I will establish my covenant, covenant as an everlasting covenant between me and you and your descendants after you from, for the generations to come. Now here's the covenant. To be your God and the God of your descendants after you. Yahweh is swearing that I will be your God forever. 
Interesting, since he's the only true God there is. He says, I swear to you and to your descendants that I will be your God forever. And I will establish, this is another translation, and I will establish my covenant between me and thee and thy seed after thee and their generations for an everlasting covenant to be a God unto thee and to, see, and to thy seed after thee. Another one says, and I will make between me and you and your seed after you through all generations an eternal agreement, which is what a covenant is, to be a God to you and to your seed after you. So, of course, a covenant is, you know, the contract, uh, the um, agreement that goes between two people. And the interesting thing with this covenant, and I'm, you know, is, you know, I'm not going to go into all the detail, but, you know, back in the day, the covenant with the animals and the splitting of the animals and the walking between the animals, the parties, you know, did this thing. Abraham went to sleep. And Yahweh walked between the animals himself. Because it has nothing to do with Abraham. Yahweh saying, I will always be your God to you and to your seed. And that's why we see in Exodus, when Yahweh hears the cry after all them years of slavery, he hears the cry and he selects Moses and he goes down, and, and, and this is what he's telling him, because I swore to your fathers that I would be your God. See, the, he's coming to the rescue because of the promise that he made to be Elohim, God, to Abraham and his descendants. So I think it's interesting that you know, Denise was making reference to Micah's message a couple weeks ago about the awesomeness of this God we serve. And we say all these wonderful things, creator of heaven and earth, and he's holy, and he's worthy of worship. And I have feedback. Where's William? Mark? Somebody help me. I don't like that. <laughs> um that, you know, these generations, and even as you go through Genesis with each of Abraham's descendants, you know, you get Isaac, and then once Isaac's in the right place, Yahweh does the same thing with him, reminds him, this is the covenant, thank you, this is the covenant that I will be a God to you. So we have this holy, you know, and we say all the right words, and we are doing all the right, you know, verbally, and maybe we have the right thought process about our actions are pathetic. We complain, we moan, we mourn, we gossip, we do all this stuff. Well, how great is your God? You know, life is hard. Uh, Denise sent me something. And I, I kept a part of it, and it said something about he didn't. He call he's the hard. It's talking about the hardships of life and how you're. It's just life. You know, you're either coming out of one, going into one. This is life. But it's like he's not doing. He's doing this stuff happens to you to make you holy. He's not interested in making your life happy. And I'm like, this is a good thought because we think serving God is supposed to make our life happy and wonderful. All on the surface, the surface. But he's trying to perfect us into holiness. And that's usually not comfortable. So I thought it was interesting that our guests, because my main chapters, and I say chapters, that's why I'm going to watch the clock. We're going to look at Deuteronomy 28 to 30. And I think it's interesting 
you know, they're getting ready to go into the promised land. You know, Deuteronomy is uh, the refreshing of the law, reminding them of everything they've been through. And, you know, they're getting ready now to go into the land. And, you know, just like us, they need to be reminded of some things. So the first 14 verses of chapter 28 are talking about blessings for obedience. See, there is no... Yahweh will always be your God. And like I said before, it's funny because he's the only God there is. So it's, it's therefore... There's nothing you could do about it. But that's the only unconditional thing there is. I'm God. Who is like unto me? No conditions, no fixing, changing, altering, nothing. But for some reason, we've transferred that. I just have to say, I believe and do nothing. It's not scriptural. There are many, many ifs and thens in the Bible. If my people who are called by my name would turn from their wickedness, then so you got to do something. You want the blessing? Then this is what you got to do. Salvation isn't free. I have to repent. I have to do something. It just doesn't come to me. We're not all going to heaven. The whole world and all the people there is aren't all going to heaven. You have to do something to get there. Now, he did what it took. I got to apply my faith. I got to repent and believe. But I got to do something. And when I do that, repent and be converted, then your sins are blotted out. Not until then, but until I repent and convert, they're written in the book against me. The rest of the chapter, which has 68 verses... Is all about curses. 14 verses, <laughs> blessing, and all the rest are a curse. Now, we've talked about the explicitness of Yahweh, and he's pretty explicit. But the chapter starts with the word if. If. If you do this, then this is what you'll get. If, NIV, you fully obey. Now, see, we partially obey, so we're walking in bits and pieces of the blessings. But the day that we fully obey, we're going to walk into fullness of these blessings. Now, granted, this is speaking directly to Israel at the time, to going into the promised land, but Yahweh's people are Yahweh's people, no matter where you are, no matter what generation or what time. And he didn't say the blessings are only for these people at this time, period. They're for his people. And carefully follow all his commands I give you today, Yahweh, your God, will set you high above all the nations of the earth. Now, if you've read any of the Israel's history, and when they're split, Israel and Judah, I want you to know that when they're split, Israel never has a good king, ever. Judah goes up and down. But you can see the rising and the falling and the rising and the falling and the rising and the falling based on 
their behavior toward Joey. I mean, there are times where this little nation compared to all the nations round about are the most powerful, dreadful nation. I just love in Samuel. I, I mean, this is the reputation that Yahweh has. You know, he, he gets a reputation for working with his people. And before I go into Samuel, I'll just mention Rahab. That's after they're going into the land. And Joshua's leading them, and they're going to spy out Jericho so they can take it. They've been traveled in the wilderness for 40 years now. Now they're going into Jericho. Rahab is willing to risk her life. Why? I heard. I heard about everything your God did in Egypt. This is a lot of time after, but she's willing to risk her life and her household's life based on what she heard. This is the reputation that Yahweh had. And the same thing in Samuel when, of course, it didn't work for Israel because Yahweh was mad at them. When they brought the ark into battle, you know, it's, oh, we're losing. Go get the ark. Every time we have the ark, we win. But they're not, they weren't right. Every time they went and got the ark, they was in the right place, and Yahweh fought for them. But this time... And so when the ark comes, the, the ark, Israel's cheering, yay, yay, we got it, we're going to win, hooray, hooray. And they're making, I mean, this is an army, so they're making all this noise. And the Philistines over the hillside hear them say, oh, they went and got their God, oh no, we're doomed. That was the reputation that Yahweh had. Of course, Yahweh had to squash that one because he wanted to punish Israel at the time, so but. But he had this reputation even amongst the nations because of the things that, the blessings that flowed through Israel when they obeyed, when they walked in the ways of Yahweh, when they worshiped him according to the plan that he had established. They were invincible in battle. They, they flourished, they prospered, just as it says in Deuteronomy. He says, when you go in, when you come out, he's talking about the fields and in the city and from the womb. And I mean, just everywhere you go, I'm going, it's going to flow, prosperity everywhere. If you fully. The other thing, verse 2, and all these blessings shall come on thee, and over, they're going to find you and overtake you. The blessings are going to track you down. You can't run from them. They're going to track you down and overtake you. I like serving this God. You know, my blessing is coming. It isn't a thing that you could do about it if. I do my part. I don't care how much wall the enemy put up. The, that blessing is coming. It is coming to me because Yahweh said it's going to come and overtake me. If you hearken unto the voice of Yahweh, your God. Wow. I don't care what the enemy does. What anybody does, I'm getting mine. As long as I do my part. Malachi says, Bring ye all the tithes into the storehouse, that there may be meat in mine house, and prove me now. Herewith saith Yahweh of hosts, If I will not open you the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing, that there shall not be room enough to receive it. See, this is what Yahweh has for you, what he wants to give to you, if. If. So when we're lacking, and again, I don't want to focus on physical stuff. You know, we got warning in the New Testament where Peter says, may you prosper as your soul prospers, because there's an importance. 
And a lot of people, including so-called saved people, are prospering naturally, and they seem to forget Yahweh. So it's may you prosper as your soul prospers. Made me think of Matthew, though, where Yahshua said, Seek ye first the kingdom of Yahweh and his righteousness, and then I'll add all this stuff unto you. And what was all this stuff? Everything talked about in the previous verses. Shelter, clothing, food. He's going to meet all your needs. Seek him first. See, but if you seek him first and his righteousness, then he's going to give you these blessings. Now, in chapter 28, 15 through 18, um, through 68, are the consequences of disobedience. And it starts in verse 15. But, so he said, in verse 1, he said, if you do this, listen to me, obey what I say, then this is what you get. But if you do not give ear to the voice of Yahweh your God and take care to do all his orders and his laws, which I give you today, then all these curses will come on you and overtake you. Guess what? You're not hiding from those either. They will find you out. And they will come and get you. It's not a good thing. And all these curses will come after you and overtake you till your destruction is complete. Because you did not give ear to the voice of Yahweh your God or keep his law and his orders which he gave you. And of course, when I, I'm reading this, because as we go into 29, uh, which is Moses encouraging the people to keep the laws and to be obedient so that they can have the blessings. Chapter 30 is, because Yahweh knows his people, how to get back once you fall away. So he starts with, if you listen to me, I'll bless you. If you don't, you will be cursed. Moses steps in and says, kind of like Paul, I'm begging you. Listen to Yahweh. But Yahweh knows us. So chapter 30 is the condition for restoration. So we got the whole package right there in, in these three chapters. So the curses are everything opposite. You know, your crops are going to fail. You're going to be barren. I, <laughs> finances. And what was it when they were rebuilding the t- uh, when they came back from captivity and they were rebuilding their own places and making sure they looked good and Yahweh's house was in disarray and nobody was paying it any attention and Yahweh was fussing at them. Take care about your own place and leave mine looking like that. Guess what? Pockets with holes in it. You, everything that you gain, I'm a decrease. It'll look like you're prospering, but I'm going to suck it up and it, the worms is going to come in and eat it and because you neglect me. I'm not first. So guess what? You have to suffer the consequences of the curse. Verse 47 of 28 says, oh, well, let's go to 46. These things will come on you and on your seed to be a sign and a wonder forever. Now, he's talking about the curses. So they're going to come upon you to be a sign forever because you did not give honor to Yahweh, your God, worshiping him gladly. See, not just worship him. Worship him gladly 
with joy in your heart on account of all your wealth of good things. Yahweh don't want much, like I've said before. He just wants everything. Gladly worship with joy in your hearts. Coming to service, going to ministry, whatever it is, if it's a chore, if you got attitude, bad attitude, and you're wondering where the blessings are, because you're doing what Yahweh said do, but you're missing a part, worshiping him gladly. With joy in your heart, on account of all your wealth of good things. And we're very blessed here. Chapter 29. Moses says in verse 9, So keep the words of this agreement and do them, so that it may be well for you in everything you do. He's taking a whole chapter here to try to, you know, like Paul in Romans 12, 1 and 2. I'm begging you. You know, you don't have to. I mean, you don't have to put your body up as a living sacrifice. But I'm begging you that you do this. It's beneficial and it's at your reasonable service. It's your reasonable service. Fully obey. Fully hearken unto. We're picking and choosing. I like that. That suits me fine. I don't like doing that. I don't see why we have to do that. I don't. I'm not comfortable doing that. Fully, fully. So we're walking in this partial blessing. I don't know about you all, but I like all of mine. And I, I got to work on some of this stuff too. I'm a procrastinator. Verse 13 of 29, And so that he may make you his people today and be your God, as he has said to you, and as he made an oath to your fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. That's why I started in Genesis 17, 7. He's saying to them here, all this, I mean, this is a long time since Genesis 17, 7. And he's reminding them, as he said to you and made the oath to your fathers to be your God. He wants to be Elohim because he is Elohim. So he wants to be it. It gives him great pleasure to pour out his blessing. He takes no pleasure in the curses. He takes no pleasure, as we see in the New Testament, that any soul should be lost. He has no pleasure in loss of souls. It's just that as during the lesson, I think I said it at the beginning and at the end, that when Yahweh makes these statements, it's not because he has this ego. I am God and you will do what I say because I'm God. He does it because he's so holy, awesome, sovereign. That us fallen creature can't just come into his presence any way and live. I mean, he can't alter his nature. He can't change who he is. That's the bottom line. Fallen creature, holy God. You have to come the way he said so that you'll live. So he wants you to come to him and be alive. He desires fellowship with you. But this is the way it has to be in order for it to work. Yeah. 
verse 19. Someone may hear the conditions of this promise. He may think that he is so blessed, and I believe this is a basic English translation, in case you're looking and it's kind of funny. Someone may hear the conditions of this promise. Again, this is Moses talking to the people. He may think that he is so blessed that he can say, I'll be safe even if I go my own stubborn way. Oh, does this sound familiar? After all, Yahweh would never sweep away well-watered ground along with dry ground. Big head. Verse 20. Yahweh will never be willing to forgive that person because Yahweh's burning anger will smolder against him. All the curses described in this book will happen to him. Yahweh will erase every memory of that person's name from the earth. This translation was, I thought it was the uh, English, but the basic English, but it's God's word. I mean, when I read that 19 in God's word, I'm like, this sounds like the church today. I could do whatever I want. He would never. He would never. You know, I mean, this is a God of love. He would never. Compassionate. But where does he get the thought process? He gets the thought process from He may think that he is so blessed that he can say, I can do what I want. Those are probably those defiant ones we were talking about earlier today. And there remaineth no more sacrifice. Willful sinners. Chapter 30, the condition of restoration. Now, again, Yahweh knows his people. If he didn't know us, this chapter wouldn't be here (laughs) because he would think that we would just do what he said. But he also, it's a very merciful chapter because he's letting you know that should you mess up, It's not the end. It can be fixed. It can be fixed because he's your God. And he is a loving God. And he is a merciful God. And so he puts in... Uh, that my Bible says, prosperity after turning to Yahweh, the conditions of restoration. When all these blessings and cursings I have set before you come upon you and you take them to heart, whatever Yahweh your God disperses, excuse me, wherever Yahweh your God disperses you among the nations, That was also part of the curses. Like I said, I'm trying to do. Part of the curses is he would disperse them amongst the people. Where if they followed him, he would raise them up. They'd be large amongst the nations. If they disobeyed, he dispersed them. And we see several, you know, times like through the judges and all that they would be under rule of different powers. And then we see when the kings came along, different Uh, powers would rule over them for short periods of time and again with the up and downness of their hearts towards their God so he's telling them he's also prophesying so uh, whenever you're amongst all these nations that I'm sending you to because you're not going to listen to me and when you and your children return to Yahweh your Elohim so he also saying you will come back And obey him with all your heart and with all your soul, according to everything I command you today. 
Then Yahweh your Elohim will restore your fortunes and have compassion on you and gather you again from all the nations where he scattered you. Now, of course, this is prophetic. You know, we have a, a prophecy here that we would look at. But it's also about us when, when we fall away or anybody that falls away. There's this process of restoration. And you turn your hearts, and your hearts are turned again to Yahweh your God, and you give ear to his word, which I give you today, you and your children, with all your heart and with all your soul. Now, he's doing the same thing. It can't be half-hearted. You have to come back, and when you come back, it has to be all the way. There's no half-heartedness. Matthew 22, 37, Yahshua said unto him, Thou shalt love Yahweh thy Elohim with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy mind. So it's not any different. You have to, it's the same thing. This is the first and great commandment. Now that was Yahshua's teaching. He's teaching and saying that, you know, somebody came and asked him, well, you know, what's the greatest commandment? And he, this is what he said, to love Yahweh, your Elohim, with all your heart, mind, and soul. And this is the first and the greatest. It's the first because that's your main relationship. It's the greatest because everything proceeds from it. Everything proceeds from it. Yahshu went on to say, and the second is like unto the first. Love your neighbor as yourself. Everything proceeds from the first. If you're going to love Yahweh with all your heart, soul, mind, strength, you're going to love your neighbor as yourself. You can't do it. Yahweh holds you guilty if you offend your neighbor. Even if you don't know you offended your neighbor, you're guilty. That's what he said. You're guilty, and you have offended him. Verse 6 of chapter 30. And Yahweh thy God will circumcise thine heart and the heart of thy seed to love Yahweh thy God with all thine heart and with all thy soul that thou mayest live. And Yahweh will do something to you. For it is Elohim with which worketh in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. It's Yah. I mean, he's, there's nothing different. You know, we got to stop Old Testament, New Testament. Yahweh's the same yesterday, today, and forever. His verbiage is different, you know, and we'll see as some of the younger people, when Leo gives his poems and Will preaches and that, we get some new verbiage. But it's good verbiage. I mean, it meshes with, you know, because they're young. Not that I'm old, but they're young. And so we, you know, so he's talking to in different times and in, in different, you know, this is prior to the Holy Spirit. And, you know, so Yahshua, but he's saying the same thing. He's not saying anything different. You have to love Yahweh and obey him. Yahweh is the one who gave the sacrificial system. He's the one who set down all the rules. We've looked at them. All the rules. You're going to bring me a burnt offering? It has to be this, 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 that's an act. And this is what you do to it. And this is how you do it. And, and blah, 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 blah. And if it's a sin offering, then this is what you do. And if you're poor, this is what you do. And if you, you're a leader, this is what you do. And all of that. Yahweh was very meticulous. He gave all of that. And then in Samuel says, I'd rather have you listen to me than bring me these sacrifices. I'd rather have you listen to me. Listen to me. Why? So I can bless you. If you would listen to me, I think I sound like a mother talking to my children. If you would just listen to me. Listen to me. Then 
you wouldn't have all these problems. I sounded like Yahweh. I didn't know that. But this is what Yahweh's saying. If you listen to me, I could save you so much heartache because the blessings will come after you. They'll pursue you. They'll chase you down. I'm thinking of the Sister Penny gave me something to read. And at first when she told me what it was called, I'm thinking, oh, poor man. He's drinking from a saucer. But he says, I'm drinking from a saucer because my cup is overflown. I'm drinking from a saucer because my cup is overflown. That's what Yahweh wants to do. He wants you to drink from the saucer. Because you can't even pick up the cup. It's so overflown. And we can't fathom it. We don't know what it is. I mean, I think we got a lot of blessing. But I don't think we really know what it is to truly be blessed by Yahweh. Because we don't know how to give him our all. We don't know how to do it. But praise his name. He's so merciful and gracious and a wonderful instructor. He is teaching us again and again how to be able to give him our all. Verse 10. If you, if you give ear to the voice of Yahweh your God, keeping his orders and his laws, which are recorded in this book of the law, and turning to Yahweh your God with all your heart, again, with all your heart and all your soul. For these orders which I have given you today are not strange and secret and are not far away. They are not in heaven for you to say, who will go up to heaven for us and give us knowledge of them so that we may do them? And they are not across the sea for you to say, who will go over to the, the sea for us and give us news of them so that we may do them? But the word is very near you in your mouth and in your heart so that you may do it. So that you may do it. Yeah, we didn't tell us to do these things and then hide them from us. Put them far away and make it complicated. It's right near unto us. Romans 10, 8 says, but what saith it? The word is nigh thee, even in thy mouth and in thy heart. That is the word of faith which we preach. That if thou should confess with thy mouth the master Yahshua, and shall believe in thine heart that Elohim hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. It's not any different. He said the same thing. It's right near. Salvation is right there. Remember, this is chapter 30 is the restoration after you've fallen away. It's right there. It's right there. It's not hidden from you. It's accessible. And even more so to us on this side of Calvary. We have no excuse. There's no excuse. Back to chapter 30, verse 17. But if your heart is turned away and your ear is shut and you go after those who would make you servants and worship of other gods, I give witness against you this day that destruction will certainly be your fate and your days will be cut short in the land where you are going, the land of your heritage on the other side of Jordan. Whosoever therefore shall be ashamed of me and my words and this adulterous and sinful generation of him also shall the son of man be ashamed when he cometh in the glory of his father with his holy angels there's not any difference you know we can't throw out that that's not gone that that 
pertains to our salvation, that that pertains to my blessing, that that pertains. What must we do was the cry to Peter. Repent, be baptized, and filled with the Spirit. You have to do something. It's not unconditional. God is not just up there. Yes, he is God. No, there's nothing, you know, who is like unto him, and, you know, nobody can. He's who he is. Whether you believe it or not, he's there. He's who he is. You don't alter that he's the creator or anything, but it's up to you. It's up to you. And in closing, I was thinking about this, and I was thinking about, how we serve him, and why we serve him. So, of course, I have song lyrics. <laughs> but I was thinking of, you know, the three Hebrews in the fiery furnace. And they first make their, you know, when uh, Nebuchadnezzar, he loves these guys. I mean, he thinks they're great. You know? <laughs> and, you know, he gets word that they didn't bow down. They didn't listen to your decree. And so he goes to them, and he says, I'm going to give you another chance because I really like y'all. And he said, so when you hear, bow down, and they say, uh, no, we can't do that because our God will save us. And then I think there was this pause. I'm, you know, this is my imagination here. I think there was this pause, and one elbowed the other. All right, don't you remember so-and-so? Yahweh didn't save him. And then they say, but even if he doesn't, but even if he doesn't, we won't. Job has a famous statement. Though he slay me, yet will I trust him. And I thought about these examples here, and I thought about, you know, they were trusting in a promise. You know, Job knew about the resurrection, and he was holding on to, though, if I, though he slay me, I got a life hereafter. My question is, what if? There was nothing else. This is all there is. He's still Yahweh, but there's no hereafter. Does that alter? Are you worshiping him for those things that are set aside over there? And this is where the lyrics of the song come. You may ask me why I serve the Lord. Is it just for heaven's gain? or to walk the mighty streets of gold, or to hear the angels sing? Is it just to drink from the fountain that never shall run dry, or just to live forever and ever in that sweet old by and by? If there were never any streets of gold, even a land where we'd never grow old, it's been worth just having the Lord in my life. Living in a world of darkness, he came along and brought me the light. But if heaven never were promised to me, even God's promise to live eternally, it's been worth just having the Lord in my life. I was living in a world of darkness, and he came along and brought me the light. Yahweh's worthy even if there's nothing else even if there's nothing else. Because I think about where I would be just in this life. Forget about a future life. Just in this life, if he hadn't come and brought me the light. You know, prison, like I tell you all, I, I'm very capable of killing somebody. Prison, mental hospital, been close to the breakdown, but because Yahweh was in my life, he, ro and he rose me up. You know, dead. Those were the options. I'd rather be living, living this life with him. There's another song running in my head. <laughs> living this kind of life, you know. Even if there's nothing in the future. If that's where we are, then he's worth everything. Because everything we have is because of him. Every, and the scripture bears that out. It says every good gift comes from him. 
even to the wicked, if they're walking in good things, it came from Yahweh because he's just that merciful, and I'm so glad to know him.